your Great. family go to shul? Oh yeah, yeah. My father, um, my father was in charge of the uh, entertainment uh, at the Addis, and I didn't know why until um, uh, 2006. I took a um, DNA test, and my cousin who took the DNA test was found through another cousin because I spell my name H-E-B-S-C-H-E-R and he spelled it H-U-E-B which is pronounced Hipshire. So they found him and he asked me to take a DNA test and I took a DNA test and I found out that I have close relatives all over the country. And he told me that my father's name was not Max, it was Marcus. But in Yiddish, it was Muttel. So when we, when my kids were, were young, and we were driving along the highway, I used to say to them, you know, my father was pretty popular in Hamilton, his name was Muttel. Take a look, there's one there, there's one there. There's all over the country, you'll see Muttels. <laughs> so, Tell me about Ken Sobel. Oh, Ken Sobel, okay. Um, 1953, Ken Sobel came to the Palace Theater. Uh, no, he sent one of his uh, men to the Palace Theater. He wants two tickets for the show. We had a st uh, stage show that night. So I said, okay. So I gave him two tickets, and he came in. And his wife sat down to watch the show, and he came in the office to talk to me. And he says, uh, how much profit do you make on the ice cream? So I told him, how much profit do you make on the popcorn? So I told him. I says, you're in TV and radio business. What are you doing with popcorn and ice cream? He says, oh. He says, I'm going to have the arena on Barton Street. He says, come on. No, he didn't say that. He says, I'm going to go into business. He says, I'm going to pick you up for lunch tomorrow, and we'll go for lunch, and I'll show you what I'm going to do. I said, OK. So he picked me up, and I didn't even have a car at the time. He says, you drive. I said, okay. So we went to the Jewish Community Center on Delaware. They had lunch there, and we had lunch. Then we drove down to Barton Street, and we stopped in front of the farm, the arena. I said, why are we stopping in front of the old barn? That's what we used to call it. He says, it's not the old barn anymore. He says, it's my, it belongs to me, and we're going to have the Junior Red Wings here. I says, oh, that's good. So then he drove me back, and uh, he called me a couple of days later. He said, I want to see you in the office. So I went up. This was um, September, uh, September 53. And uh, he said, uh, I'd like you to come and work for me. I said, doing what? He says, well, buying the films for the TV station, running the arena or anything I have, you'll be involved with. I says, okay, what are you gonna pay? So he told me, I said, I'm making more money now. He says, but you'll eventually make more money with me. I said, no, I can't do that. So he says, okay, we'll make a deal. So we made a deal, September, and he says, okay, you're hired. When are you gonna start? I said, I'll start the day after New Year's. He says, why are you gonna do that? I says, because Christmas, I'm entitled to a $1,500 bonus. And I says, 1953, $1,500 is a lot of money. He says, okay. So the day after New Year's, I went down to the forum. They got my name on the door already, manager and this and that. And uh, one day, uh, I was doing the film buying for the TV station. I didn't know how to buy films for a TV station. I didn't know anything about it. But uh, one of the Dunkelmans had, uh, had films. Uh, they had about 250 films. And they came down to see Ken Solo. And he says, I don't know about movies. We'll take you to my movie, man. So they came down. We sat in a restaurant. And he was showed me the movies. Well, they're okay, you know. In those days, in the 50s, there were good movies. What were they? The Bowery Boys, uh, things like that, you know, tough movies. So I said to him, if you 
deliver the 250 movies in good condition to us for 10 years we'll have them we'll give you $50 a movie so Ken's almost kicking me under the table I said you get cash when you get when you bring the movies he's kicking me under the table <laughs> so the guy says you got a deal so I said shake hands with him he says no you shake hands with him so anyway we got 250 movies in, we stored them at the forum, and we started to play the movies. So Ken Sofa said to me, what are you doing? He says, 250 movies, that's a lot of money. I said, look, you're gonna play them five or six times. It's gonna cost you $5 to play. If you have a strike here and everybody walks out, I'll run the projector and play movies 24 hours a day. He says, oh, good deal. After that day, he never once asked me how much I'm going to pay or what I did with the movies. Never. Never. Never asked me a question. Just said, good movie last night or something like that. So um, now he asked me uh, to meet him at the TV station. He says, we're going to take a ride. So we took a ride out to Governor's Road. Uh, there was a a stationery store in Hamilton by the name of Smith. And uh, he owned um, 110 acres out there. He had a horse farm out there, but he had no money. So Solvo said to me, I want to buy this property. I said, what are you going to do with it? He says, eventually, I'll do something with it. I said, okay. So he paid him $30,000 for 110 acres. Let me just pause. Do you know what piece of land he's talking about? Yeah. Do you? The Bar so. 11 Ranch. It's, cro it's across the street from me, across the street, Senator Holmes, all those near that right. subdivision. It's, it's across the street from what? Where I live. Oh, you live? Um, I live up Governor's. In the section across the road where they built the new school? Yeah, I live on that side of the street. Ken Sobel owned the other side of the street. Yeah, no, he owned that side of the street, too. He owned too. both sides of the street? Yeah, but the, uh, what they do with the houses that where that school is being built? There were no houses. Oh, there weren't, okay. No. I'll tell you the story about that one, too. So, um, bought the property, went back to the office, and he says, now, I'm going to open an account called KDS Commercial Enterprises, which is Kenneth David Sobel Commercial Enterprises. I'm going to put the money in the bank, You'll be able to sign. You buy every piece of property that's connected to what I just bought. I said, okay. So I was going out and I was buying. Uh, Joe Agro was in real estate at the time. And he was my, my uh, real estate agent. We went out and we bought properties, 18 acres here, 20 acres here. And then he, there was a, a chap that owned a house and uh, Joe went and spoke Italian to him. He didn't want to sell. So Joe said, you know, you're, this is your second wife. If you pass away, her children are going to get your money. So you should sell now and give the money to your children. He says, good deal. So we bought that property. Then across the road, uh, there, I forget how many acres there were, but we, I bought that property too. I bought it in my name and then transferred it to his name. So one day, <clears throat> Jack Wilson, the uh, public utilities from Dundas, uh, phoned me, I want to see you out here. I said, okay, Jack, I'll come out. So I went out, and he says, I want to build a water tower out there. You see the water tower? I says, uh, how much space do you need? He says, about a half an acre. I says, what are you going to pay? He says, one dollar. I said, okay, what are you going to do for me? He says, just ask. So I said, I want a circular driveway here. He says, okay. And I says, across the road, the bar 11, in the main house, we don't have any running water. It's all well water. He says, I'll, I'll do that. Put a hydrant out in front, ran the water in, very cooperative. So almost said to me, what are they building in the back? I says, a water tower for Dundas. How much they pay you? I says, one dollar. Mm, giving away bargains, are you? 
I says, no, that's part of the deal with, with the city of Dundas. They'll look after us. Has you got water in the house now? He says, yeah. So, so when you bought these properties, everyone knew you were Jewish? Well, I don't know. I didn't tell them. They didn't ask me. But uh, there, one, one, um, one place we went to was called um, DeLottenville, and she was in the back. And I found out that uh, she was divorced, so Joe and I, and I walked in there, and Joe said uh, to her, uh, I'm a real estate agent. He says, wouldn't you like to move to the city now? She says, yeah, I would. So he made her an offer, and she accepted it right away. Um, I don't know if anybody, they knew Ken Sobel was Jewish. I mean, everybody knew that. But, uh, but wasn't it the case that uh, Jews could not own property in Westdale? That's right. Now, well, this this happened in in the in in the thirties, uh -huh. but we're talking about nineteen fifty four already, nineteen fifty five, fifty six, and up. See. I see. So the next property we bought. Uh, oh yeah. So one day. <laughs> I, I don't know, you can cut this out if you want, but I have to tell you the story. One day, Ken Sobel got a call from the Dundas Police Department. He says, you know uh, your property across the road with the circular driveway? He says, yeah, yeah, I know it, I own it. There's somebody who's running a red light district up there. She didn't know that. He phones down, Sam, I want to see you. Go up. You know what's going on in the, the crossroad from the uh, bar eleven? I says no. I says I let, rented it to a lady from Montreal. He says, well, they're running a whorehouse over there. I says, oh, I better go and get her out, but she owes me a couple of months' rent. He says, well, take it out and trade. <laughs> he was he was he was okay, you know. So. Were there ever, Sam. Ask the question bluntly, were there ever any Jewish cookers? In Hamilton? Yeah. Well, I didn't uh, uh, subscribe to them, but there were. Yeah, there were. Um, so anyway, uh, Ken Solo said to me one day, he says, Lady Eaton, Rolls Royce, must be for sale. He says, I like that car, I want it. I said, okay. So I got a hold of somebody and I said, we want that Rolls Royce that Lady Eaton's had because it was a nice big gray one. Did you see the million dollar check in there? I'll tell you that story in a minute. So we got him the Rolls Royce and uh, he had a, a, a man working out at the Bar 11 Ranch and he used to drive the Rolls Royce for him. He used to put a chauffeur's cap on, but only if he went to certain places. If he went to a place where there were poor people, never took that car. So he was out of town one day, and Dennis, who looked after the Bar 11 and drove the Rolls Royce, he says, uh, what are you doing? I says, not much. He says, I'll pick you up. I said, okay. So he comes up with the Rolls Royce. Sobel was out of town, and he says, sit in the back. I said, where are we going? We're going to the racetrack. So we go to the racetrack. They salute him when he walked, drove in. We drove along the highway. The cars were way over. So uh, I, we were just going to the temple on a Friday night, and I had CHML on, and they said Ken Sobel just passed away. Oh, wow. So uh, he was uh, 54, I think, 54, 56. So he had a heart attack. But before that, uh, around Christmas, when we got bonuses, there were five of us that got bonuses. He always wanted to sign the checks before. So he signed the checks that afternoon. He died that evening. So um, He contributed a lot to the Jewish community. Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, one day, must be six months later, I... Uh, Dave Goldberg, the lawyer, and uh, Canada Trust Company came up to my office and they said, uh, 
you have two checks we'd like you to sign for the estate. I said, I don't have anything to do with the estate. Just sign the checks for us, please, and we'll tell you why. So they put the checks down. There's one in there, one million two hundred thousand. I signed that. I signed another one for two hundred and fifty thousand, I think it was. The money went into the estate. I says, how come I'm signing? Well, since you signed it, we'll tell you. You were the only signing officer for KDS Commercial Enterprises. You ever hear of anybody doing a thing like that? His family, or he, he didn't sign the checks, nor did his family. That's why I saved that check. People don't believe me that I once had a million two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So, um, now, <clears throat> uh, it's time to sell, he, he, he traded the Rolls Royce for a different one, and the Rolls Royce is sitting out in the barn at the Bar 11 Ranch, and, uh, I, they asked me to sell it. So I put an ad in the paper and nobody responded. So I phoned Toronto. There was a Rolls Royce dealer there called a Donald Mackey. And they came in, they looked at the Rolls Royce and they took it. Yeah, we'll sell it. Two days was sold because they were Rolls Royce dealers. And what else? Oh, I gave stuff away uh, from the house. I gave a lot of stuff away. The, uh, There's a guy in Shallow Village, Harold Cudlitz. Harold Cudlitz, yeah. Was he also in the entertainment business? Well, he was a booker. He he booked shows for uh, for the uh, downtown uh, restaurants and things. So a lot of celebrities came to him. Yeah, talk about some of the Jewish guys, some of the Jewish entertainers that came by. Well, I didn't know many of them. Like I say, I saw Al Jolson's and and uh -huh. Eddie Cantler is a thing there. Uh, we had imitators come. We had a guy that imitated Al Jolson. Um, in fact, Sam, Sam Price, uh, he used to be a lawyer. He has an Al Jolson club. <laughs> and he's got people all around the country that gather to celebrate Al Jolson's. Um, like when we went to the steam bath, for instance, we were kids. So it was 50 cents for a family. It was on Windsor Street. And I even remember, you know where Windsor Street is? I bet you've never been down there. Hess Street, Caroline Street, Barton Street. The last street before Barton Street was a little house, a steam bath, uh, a cold jumping in bath or whatever. But we used to sit there and listen to the European guys talking about the Cossacks and the horses they were on and they were fighting this and fighting that. We had a great time. I, I think I was six or seven years old. So a family, like we had three brothers, instead of my father and the three brothers having a bath at home and using the gas, we'd go there for 50 cents. We'd have a great time. They always served us, uh, what do you call it? Um, this uh, salty milk, uh, buttermilk. So I never understood why this, they served uh, buttermilk. It was very salty because in the steam bath you sweat a lot, so you eat salt, <laughs> get it back. So we had. Uh, that what was, other things do you have written down there just so that we don't leave anything out? All right, I'll tell you. My parents were married when my mother was 15, my father was 21. They worked for Copley, Noyes, and Randalls, making uniforms for the First World War. And uh, my sister was born on York Street. I was born on John Street. Your father lived on John Street. But I lived on the other side of the tracks. <laughs> he lived on this side of the tracks. The Wies and Goldblatt's lived there. And uh, there were a few people, Jewish people, lived on John Street North at the time. and. Um, my sister was married on York Street in 1936. You have the picture. And uh, the streetcar used to run up York Street. So we used to grab a hold with our bikes, ride all the way up York Street, free ride. That was dangerous, but we did it. We, uh, I was 16, I left school to help my father. In the middle of winter, we used to go down to the uh, 
steel company and hold the bags and fill them up with coke from the steel company, 100 pound bags of coke. We used to deliver them to the people that bought the coal. She wouldn't let us throw it in the window. We had to bring it in the door and walk down the stairs and throw it in the chute. 100 pound bags I was carrying at that time. Build up some good muscles. Yeah, so uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't easy times during the depression. Then the uh, the inspector was, would chase you around because if you had too much weight, you would get fined for it. I have a couple of interesting things here. There was a guy in Hamilton called uh, Philly Alter. He was a boxer. He was a good boxer. Jewish guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh yeah, 1930s. Uh, Ada Lightstone, I don't know her married name, I forget it now. She was married to a doctor who passed away years ago. She was the first Jewish teacher at Hess Street School. And Hess Street School had 40 uh, former students enlist into the services in 1939 to 44. Uh, there were 40 of us. Today, there were five of us left. There was uh, one Jewish girl. She was in the Navy, and she's gone. And they're all gone now except five. Five are left. Two of my brothers were in with me. They're gone. And all these people lived in and around York Street. York Street, Cannon Street, Caroline Street, Ray Street, Pearl Street, Peter Street, Hess Street. All around there, 40 of us. I mean, we didn't go to school uh, together, but like we went separate, separate times. So there are maybe five or six of us left out of the whole gang. So I think I'm the oldest. No, no, uh, Norm Levitt's the oldest. He's 92. So, um, oh yeah. I used to go to Volsolowski's for lunch. And uh, Milton, Milton um, Schwartz was the uh, Jewish undertaker. And when he walked into Bozlowski's at noon, we, some guys went out the back door, some guys stayed there. We knew there was something up. He says, I need four pallbearers. Could you imagine that? Jewish person dying, and he needs four pallbearers. There were two there. There were some family, females, they couldn't be pallbearers. But there were two relatives, so they're all together sitting in the chapel were six people. So I volunteered, I think, three or four times. They said it was a mitzvah. You know what a mitzvah is. So, so we'd go and we'd be the pallbearers from the, the uh, undertakers to the cemetery and then we'd bury the person and they come over and shake our hands and ask us to come back for a drink, but we didn't. And if you went to Bosolowski's, any time of the day, you'd hear the news, no matter what, who died, who got divorced, who had a baby, who left town, who came to town, who opened a business, who closed a business. You know, I mean, you'd hear everything there. So. Um, there was one guy there, and his name was Eddie Shore. He used to come there almost every day. He was murdered. They never found out who, uh, who killed him. Uh, they used to call, uh, uh, what was his name? Paul Sam, was his first name Sam Paul? They used to call him Lefty. And everybody said, why are you calling him Lefty? He says, we know, he's, he's never right, so we call him Lefty. <laughs> so, so um, let me see. What I have was the name of the Jewish undertaker again? Milton Schwartz at the time. Where was his uh, place? A Vine Street. See, they also have the, uh, they call him the Hever Kadisha who prepare the, uh, the body. Right. The, the women have women, and well, Goldie, who lives across the hall, Goldie Robbins, her, her mother, her sister, they're all doing the job. Um, We've got about two more minutes of tape. Okay. Hi. Oh, uh, yeah, 
Rocca Perry came into the store one day. And my mother says, we're going to close for a week, so if you need anything, get it now. Why are you closing for a week? We're going to a wedding in New York. How are you going? She says, by train. He says, no, you're not. He says, my driver will take you to New York and bring you home. She says, no, Rocco, I'm go. no, 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 I insist. Well, the driver pulled up. My parents got in the back of the car. There were two guys in the front talking Italian all the way. Drove them to where they were going to stay with my grandmother in New York. They went to the wedding. They came back the day they were supposed to and brought them back to Hamilton. And Rocco Perry didn't take five cents for it. He wouldn't. Mm. He, he was good to a lot of Jewish people. Even though they didn't buy his booze or anything, he was still good to, to Jewish people. And nobody ever found out what happened to him. And what was his wife's name again? Uh, Bessie Starkman. Starkman, yeah. yeah. Right. 